One of the most famous images of the book of Daniel, and indeed in all of apocalyptic literature, is the statue that Nebuchadnezzar sees in his dream in Daniel chapter 2. This statue has a head of gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. The statue is destroyed when a stone cut from a mountain strikes the feet and brings down the statue. Daniel interprets the parts of the statue as a series of kingdoms. Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold to whom God, the God of heaven, has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory. After him will come another kingdom inferior to his, then a third which will rule over the whole earth. Then there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, which will crush and shatter all these. The iron is mixed with clay, symbolizing intermarriage, but the iron and clay will not hold together. Then finally the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. It will crush the previous kingdoms and will stand forever. While the kingdoms are not named, the first four are patently identified with Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece, since these are the kingdoms that succeed each other throughout the book of Daniel. Chapters 1 to 5 are set under Babylonian kings, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. Chapter 6 is in the reign of the fictitious Darius the Mede, but the last verse refers to the succeeding reign of Cyrus the Persian. Chapter 7 reverts to the reign of Belshazzar, and this is also the setting for chapter 8. Chapter 9 is the reign of Darius the Mede, and chapter 10 is set under Cyrus of Persia, but the angel Gabriel tells Daniel that he is fighting the prince or patron angel of Persia, and that after him the prince of Greece will come. Chapter 11 begins with a prophecy that there will be three more kings of Persia, and then it continues with a detailed prophecy of the Hellenistic kingdoms down to the reign of Antiochus IV Epiphanes. No Median kingdom ever ruled over Judah. This is why we get the fictitious Darius the Mede in Daniel chapter 6, and again in 11.1. Daniel was evidently drawing on an older schema in which included the Medes. He would have had no reason to put them in. In Daniel chapter 2, the metals have declining, uh, declining value, a motif paralleled in Hesiod's works and days. In his works and days, Hesiod described a sequence of five ages, golden, silver, bronze, a fourth that is not identified with a metal and iron. The fourth age begins the pattern of decline and is inserted to accommodate the heroes of Greek legend. <clears throat> Hesiod also was evidently adapting a schema that he did not invent. Uh, he, had, he had inherited a schema that had the four metals and he adapted it by putting in an age to accommodate the Greek heroes. The origin of that schema, though the origin of the schema with the four metals, is unknown. Uh, it presumably has something to do with the metals that were used, as we still speak, of the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and so forth. This Four Kingdom schema was not, in, was not peculiar to the Book of Daniel. I mean now the schema interpreted to mean Four Kingdoms. The same sequence, but with Assyria rather than Babylon as the first kingdom, is found in the fourth Sibylline oracle, a Jewish text in Greek that dates to the late first century of the Common Era in its present form. But the nucleus of the oracle is probably older. The schema is also attested in several Roman historians. A fragment of Emilius Sura, who is otherwise unknown, is preserved by Valeus Paterculus around the turn of the era. The Assyrians were the first of all races to hold power, then the Medes, after them the Persians, then the Macedonians, then when the two kings, Philip and Antiochus of Macedonian origin, had been completely conquered, 
Soon after the overthrow of Carthage, the supreme command passed to the Roman people. In the Jewish text, the final kingdom is a kingdom of God. In the Roman text, the final, presumably lasting kingdom is Rome. <coughs> The idea that there was a sequence of world kingdoms identified as Assyria, Media, and Persia is as old as Herodotus. In the course of his inquiry as to how the Persians became lords of Asia, the historian wrote, the Assyrians had held the empire of Upper Asia for the space of 520 years, when the Medes set an example of revolt from their authority. Later, the Medes were brought under the rule of the Persians. In this, he, uh, Herodotus claimed to follow Persian authorities, and in fact, the inclusion of media reflects a Persian point of view. From the viewpoint of the Persians, the Medes had ruled the world for a period of time. Uh, this sequence is also found in Ctesias, who had been the court physician to Artaxerxes II. The sequence Assyria Media is also found in the Book of Tobit. The suspicion arises that this view of history reflected Persian propaganda, which sought to portray Persia as the heir to the great empires of the East. But caution is in order here. The sequence of world empires is not attested in the Achaemenid inscriptions, and we have no direct evidence that it was part of Persian propaganda. In an influential essay published in 1940, Joseph Swain argued that the extension of the schema to include Greece must have developed in the context of anti-Hellenistic resistance. Emilia Sura, quoted above, considered the Second Punic War, which was from 218 to 201 BCE, as the time of the overthrow of Carthage. So Swain reasoned that he must have written before the Third Punic War of 149 to 146. Because he considered Philip, who died in 179 to mark the end of Macedonia, he must have written before the Third Macedonian War in 171 to 168. If this is correct, then the Four Kingdom Schema was known before the Book of Daniel was written. Swain supposed that the sequence of world kingdoms, including media, became known in Rome in the context of anti-Seleucid propaganda around the time of the Battle of Magnesia in 190, when Rome defeated Antiochus III, also known as Antiochus the Great. In any case, it seems likely that the sequence of four kingdoms, including Media, was current before the rise of Rome. Another early witness is found in the fourth Sibylline Oracle. The Sibyl divides history into ten generations and four kingdoms. The Assyrians are said to rule for six generations, the Medes for two, the Persians for one, and the Macedonians in the tenth. A long oracle against Rome follows, but out of numerical sequence, bringing the review of history down to the late first century of the Common Era. It seems clear, however, that the original oracle either ended with the tenth generation or with the predicted kingdom of God that was to follow it. It was presumably written before the rise of Rome. In both Jewish and Roman expressions of the Four Kingdom Schema, the climactic final kingdom is not the fourth, but the fifth, the kingdom of God in Daniel, uh, kingdom of God in Daniel, and the kingdom of Rome in Emilia Sura. It could easily function subversively to predict the demise of the fourth kingdom. This is certainly the case in Daniel, more obviously in Daniel 7 than in Daniel 2. The Roman texts, in contrast, are triumphalist from a Roman perspective. Swain supposed that the sequence had been developed for the purpose of anti-Seleucid propaganda. This is admittedly speculative, but at least it seems clear that it functions as anti-Seleucid propaganda in the book of in Daniel chapter 7. An intriguing parallel to Daniel is found in the Persian Bahman Yasht, or Zandivohman Yasin. This text survives in Pahlavi from the 9th century of the Common Era. 
Zans were midrashic elaborations of lost texts from the Avesta, part translation and part commentary. The Avesta is thought to derive from Zoroaster, whose date is controversial, but was surely earlier than the Achaemenid period. It wasn't collected, however, until the Sasanian period, so while the, it is clear that the Bam and Yasht is based on old traditions, it is relatively late in its present form. According to the Bam and Yash, chapter 1, Ahura Mazda showed the wisdom of all knowledge to Zoroaster. Through it he saw the trunk of a tree on which there were four branches, one of gold, one of silver, one of steel, and one of mixed iron. These are explained to him as the four periods which will come in the millennium of Zoroaster. The same division of metals and periods is found in another Persian Pallavi text, the Dankard, but the periods are identified differently. Daniel and the Baman Yasht share the vision form, the association of metals, uh, of the metals uh, with, and a sequence of metals beginning with gold and silver and ending with iron mixed with something. These parallels can hardly be coincidental. Both the Yasht and the Dankard identify the metals with much later kings, many centuries later than Daniel, and Daniel's statue provides a more appropriate setting for the metals than the tree in the Bam and Yasht. But the periodization of history is much more at home in Persian than in biblical tradition. So the connections, there seems to be some connection. It is difficult to trace. It is unlikely that one of these texts depended directly on the other, but they seem to share some common traditions. In the Bam and Yasht, the period of mixed iron is that of the divs having disheveled hair. Samuel K. Eddy ingeniously saw here a reference to the Greeks, who are depicted as wild-haired in mosaics and paintings in contrast to the neatly depicted hairstyles of the Persians. The Yasht would then have been written after the conquest of Alexander and would have predicted the passing of the Greek, more specifically the Seleucid kingdom, at the end of the millennium. It would have been updated later in the post sasanian period. The Yasht is problematic since its date and redaction are uncertain, but at least it lends some support to the view that Daniel was relying on a historical schema that was used more widely in the Seleucid Empire. In Daniel chapter 2, the king refuses to tell his courtiers the content of his dream. Consequently, the Babylonian wise men are unable to interpret it. Daniel succeeds because it is revealed to him by the Most High God. <clears throat> the emphasis in the chapter is on the superiority of Daniel's wisdom to that of the Babylonians. The king does not seem to be perturbed by the fact, the revelation that his kingdom will be followed by a succession of weaker ones. He falls down and worships Daniel and acknowledges Daniel's God. It may be that Nebuchadnezzar was not concerned about what might happen in the distant future. It should also be noted that Daniel is not very specific about the nature of the fifth and final kingdom, since it is set up by the God of heaven from a stone cut from a mountain suggesting Mount Zion, Jewish and later Christian readers assume that it is a Jewish kingdom. But Nebuchadnezzar could well have supposed that it would be a Babylonian kingdom, a return to the golden age of his own reign. There is some limited evidence that Babylonians hoped for a restoration of their dominion after their power had declined. The idea of a definitive lasting kingdom is attested in a text from the 6th century BCE known as the Uruk prophecy. The text extols a king who will establish judgments for the land and restore the shrines of Uruk. The king in question is most probably Nebuchadnezzar. The prophecy, however, does not predict that he will be followed by decline. Rather, after him, his son will reign in Uruk and rule the entire world. He will exercise authority and kingship in Uruk 
and his dynasty will stand forever. The kings of Uruk will exercise authority like the gods. Daniel 2 clearly implies that Babylonian power will pass, as indeed will the power of all human kingdoms. Daniel, however, does not present this interpretation in a way that is threatening to Nebuchadnezzar. The destruction of pagan kingdoms is still far in the future. We might speak of this as deferred eschatology. The power of foreign kingdoms will pass eventually, but their destruction is not necessarily imminent. For the present, the power of Nebuchadnezzar is conferred on him by God and is presumably part of the divine plan. The stories of Daniel 1 to 6 assume that Jews can prosper under foreign rule, even in the service of foreign kings. In the four kingdoms, if the four kingdom schema was devised to express resistance to world empires, that purpose is muted here. We get a quite different sense of the four kingdoms, however, in Daniel chapter 7. Here we are told that the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Four great beasts come up out of the sea. They are all hybrid creatures, like the fantastic creatures of Babylonian mythology. The first is like a lion, but has eagle's wings. The second like a bear. The third like a leopard. The fourth is the most terrifying of all. It has great iron teeth and tramples with its feet. That's probably an allusion to the war elephants used by the Seleucid kings. The fourth beast has ten horns, but then another upstart horn emerges which speaks arrogantly. An angel explains this vision to Daniel. At first he says that the beasts have four kings that shall arise out of the earth. Then Daniel inquires further. He is given a fuller account of the fourth beast and the little horn which will rise up against the Most High. This vision reaches its climax in a judgment scene. An ancient figure with white hair appears, evidently the Most High God. Then one like a son of man appears on the clouds of heaven and is presented before the figure on the throne. To him is given dominion and glory and kingship. The interpretation, however, says that the kingdom is given to the holy ones of the Most High, and then again to the people of the Holy Ones of the Most High. The angel's interpretation does not do justice to the symbolism of the vision. The turbulent sea has a long history in biblical imagery. It is said of Yahweh that by his power he stilled the sea, that's Job 26, and that he dried up the sea, Isaiah 59. It is associated with monsters, Rahab in Job 26 and Isaiah 51, and uh, Leviathan in Isaiah 27. Back before the Bible, the personified sea was a character in Canaanite mythology, known to us from the text found at Ugarit in northern Syria in 1929. Other features of Daniel 7 recall Canaanite mythology too. The most puzzling aspect of Daniel's vision is that it seems to have two divine figures, the white-haired figure on the throne and the one like a son of man who comes on the clouds. The white-haired figure is obviously the Most High God. Yet elsewhere in the Old Testament, Yahweh is always the one who rides on the clouds. Having two divine figures would not be a problem in a Canaanite context. The white-headed supreme God is Ael and the rider of the clouds is Baal. The whole vision evokes a Canaanite myth where the sea, Yam, challenges Baal for the kingship, which is conferred by the high god, Ael. Elements of this and other Canaanite myths appear throughout the Old Testament. At the time when Daniel was written, it would have been familiar to the people of Jerusalem because the Syrian king Antiochus Epiphanes installed a cult of Baal Shemaim, in the Jerusalem temple. Daniel refers to this cult with a derisive pun as the abomination that makes desolate, the Shikuts Meshomeim. And it's pointed out long ago that Meshomeim is a pun 
on Baal Shemaim. Daniel appropriates and reinterprets the symbolism of the Canaanite myth. In the Jewish context, the Ancient One is Yahweh, and the Rider of the Clouds is the Archangel Michael, Prince of Israel. The four kingdoms, including that of the Greeks and the Syrian Seleucids, are beasts that rise from the sea in open rebellion against the God of Heaven. The Holy Ones are the angelic host, led by Michael. The people of the Holy Ones, who ultimately receive the kingdom, are the Jewish people. For our present purpose, the importance of this vision is that it shows the four kingdoms that shape human history as forces of rebellion against God. In Daniel 2, in contrast, they were ordained by God and ran their course peacefully. Daniel 7, however, was written in different circumstances than Daniel 2. It presupposes the attempt by Antiochus IV Epiphanes to suppress the traditional Jewish cult in Jerusalem. Consequently, it takes a much more negative view of human history. A new world order emerged on the scene not long after the book of Daniel was written. Rome would dominate Western history for many centuries to come. The fourth Sibylline oracle, which I have already mentioned, has the sequence Assyria, Media, Persia, and Macedonia. Macedonia is both the fourth kingdom and the tenth generation. But it, uh, the Sibylline oracle follows these with an oracle about Rome, which is not integrated into the numerical sequence. The Sibyl notes the destruction of Jerusalem, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius is taken to be a sign of the impending eschatological upheavals, triggered by the fugitive from Rome, the returning Nero, who was thought to have escaped and fled to the east. Then great wealth will come to Asia, which Rome itself once plundered and deposited in her house of many possessions. She will then pay back twice as much and more to Asia, and there will be a surfeit of war. The oracle ends with a great conflagration of the resurrection of the dead. It would appear that this was an older oracle from the early Hellenistic period. It was updated to include Rome, but the Four Kingdoms schema was not revised. Since the First Kingdom is Assyria rather than Babylon, the Sibyl does not appear to be dependent on Daniel. By the end of the first century of the Common Era, a consensus developed that Daniel's fourth kingdom should be identified as Rome. We find this in the Apocalypse of Fourth Ezra, <coughs> written about the end of the first century. In chapter 11, Ezra has a dream in which he sees an eagle with 12 wings and three heads coming up out of the sea. It is eventually confronted by a lion. In chapter 12, he is given an interpretation. The eagle which you saw coming up from the sea is the fourth kingdom which appeared in a vision to your brother Daniel, but it was not explained to him as I now explain it to you. This is one of the more explicit cases of reinterpretation that you find anywhere in this literature. The eagle clearly symbolizes Rome, although the identification is not made explicit. It had 12 wings and three heads, symbolizing emperors. And it's a, a game one can play to try to identify who these emperors were. There are many different ways you can get it to work. Uh, <clears throat> but in 4th Ezra, Rome he is confronted by the Messiah, the Lion of David. In 4th Ezra 13, this messianic figure is depicted as a man who comes up out of the sea and rides on the clouds, like the Son of Man figure in Daniel chapter 7. He takes his stand on a mountain and destroys the Gentiles who come to attack him, presumably including Rome. The historian Josephus, also writing at the end of the first century of the Common Era, also identified the Fourth Kingdom as Rome. He regarded Daniel as one of the greatest prophets, who not only prophesied future things, but fixed the time at which they would come to pass. He only paraphrased some of Daniel's visions, uh, sorry, one of Daniel's visions, chapter 8. 
and he related it clearly to the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. He affirmed, however, that Daniel also wrote about the empire of the Romans and that Jerusalem would be taken by them and the temple laid waste. It has been suggested that he was referring here to Daniel chapter 11, but the reference is obscure and he doesn't make clear where Daniel is referring to Rome. Josephus makes no reference to Daniel chapter 7. His interpretation of the four kingdoms can be seen from his treatment of Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2. There we are told that the head of gold represents Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian kings who were before him. Josephus seems to regard the Medes and Persians as one kingdom and their empire will be destroyed by another king from the west. That must be Alexander the Great. This kingdom, however, will be followed by a fourth, which will be like iron and will have dominion forever because of its iron nature. No mention is made of the division of this kingdom into iron and clay, but there can be no doubt that it refers to Rome. Josephus adds that Daniel also revealed to the king the meaning of the stone, which would destroy that kingdom. But I have not thought it proper to relate this, since I am expected to write about what is past and done, and not of what is to be. It is generally assumed that he didn't want to offend the Romans by speaking of their eventual overthrow. His complete omission of Daniel 7 can be attributed to the same reason. The sequence Babylon, Media Persia, Greece and Rome, often represented as Edom, persists in rabbinic tradition. Rabbinic interpretation of Daniel, as of other books, is scattered through a vast corpus of literature. <coughs> According to Exodus Rabbah, gold refers to Babylon, silver refers to Media, brass refers to Greece, Rome that destroyed the temple is likened to iron. Um, again, an elaborate example is found in Leviticus Rabbah, it which finds the four kingdoms anticipated in Genesis chapter 2, which says that a river flowed out of Eden and there it divided and became four rivers. Uh, Genesis 15 uh, and in Leviticus 11. Uh, in Leviticus 11, the camel is said to be Babylon, the rock badger, Media, the hare, Greece, and the pig, Rome. Um, it has been argued that this text, with its negative portrayal of Rome, represents a Jewish reaction against the triumph of Christianity in the 4th century. This may be, but the identification of Rome as the 4th Kingdom was established already at the end of the 1st century and was a commonplace of Christian as well as Jewish interpretation. It is still attested by Rashi in the 11th century. Eventually, the Jewish tradition adapted the scheme to account for the rise of Islam. The Pirkei de Gede Eliezer reads Genesis 15 in light of the Four Kingdom schema, in which the animals sacrificed represent the peoples who come to oppress the Jews. In one manuscript, the turtle doves symbolize the Ishmaelites. In one variant of the schema, it begins with Rome, moves to Greece, Byzantium, then to the Sassanid Persian Empire, and finally to Ishmael, that is, Islam. In some accounts, the Fourth Kingdom consisted of a dominion shared by Rome and Islam, symbolized by Edom and Esau. The 12th century exegete Ibn Ezra regarded Rome as an offshoot of the Greek Empire, and the Fourth Empire as Islam, the most powerful empire ever. His contemporary Judah Halevi wrote a poem in which he prayed that the feet of clay would be manifested at the end of days. Ibn Daoud in 12th century Spain identified the four kingdoms as Persia, which included Babylon and Media, Greece, which included Rome, Persia, Rome, and Islam. And then there is a whole tradition that I won't dwell on here 
of pseudo-Daniel apocalypses that continued on down through the Middle Ages uh, and played on the identification of the four kingdoms in different ways. It is primarily through Christian tradition, however, that Daniel came to play a prominent role in the conception of history in the Western world. The first extended commentary on the book of Daniel, and on any Old Testament book for that matter, was produced by Hippolytus of Rome at the beginning of the third century during the persecution of Septimius Severus. Hippolytus saw no problems with the historicity of the tales in Daniel 1 to 6. He interpreted Daniel's prophecies with a Christological focus. The stone in chapter 2 is Christ, come from heaven. The fourth kingdom in chapter 7 is identified as Rome, while the fourth beast was interpreted as Rome. However, the he-goat in chapter 8 was identified as Alexander the Great, and in that chapter the little horn was Antiochus Epiphanes. In this, Hippolytus followed Josephus and reflected the original historical context of the book of Daniel. Hippolytus, however, did not think the end of history was imminent. The ten toes of the statue and the ten horns of the fourth beast were taken to require that the Roman Empire would be divided, and this had not yet come to pass. Hippolytus held that the world would last 6,000 years, and this would be followed by the thousand-year reign of Christ, since he dated the birth of Christ 5,500 years after Adam, the end of the world was still a long way off. The eschatological dimension of Daniel receded further in the writings of Origen in the early third century. Origen's commentary on Daniel is lost, but scattered examples of his exegesis of the book are preserved in other works. Origen interpreted Daniel allegorically. His understanding of Daniel 7.13 can be inferred from his commentary on Matthew 24. Christ comes every day to the soul of every believer, and the clouds are the, the scriptures that make this manifest. The Antichrist, in addition to being an eschatological figure, also signifies all heresies. The prophecy that the wise will shine like the stars is fulfilled in the life of the believers who are the light of the world. For origin, the 70 weeks of years of Daniel 9 were fulfilled with the coming of Christ. After Constantine, Christian interpreters tended to see the fourth kingdom differently. Eusebius suggested that the reception of the kingdom by the holy ones of the Most High referred to the transition of Roman imperial power from Constantine to his sons, suggesting a smooth transition from the fourth kingdom to the fifth. The fifth kingdom would be the continuation and spiritualization of the fourth. Arguably the most important contribution to the interpretation of Daniel in the patristic period were those of the Neoplatonist philosopher Porphyry and Jerome in his commentary on Daniel. Porphyry was the first to show that Daniel was pseudonymous and that the book must have been written after the persecution of the Jews by Antiochus Epiphanes, which it claimed to prophesy. He regarded the prophecy of resurrection in Daniel 12 as a metaphorical reference to the Maccabean revolt. He apparently followed the usual Jewish and Christian identifications of the first two kingdoms as Babylonian and Medo-Persian. The third kingdom was that of Alexander, the fourth that of Alexander's successors, the Diadochi. Porphyry rejected the identification of the fourth kingdom as Rome because he correctly identified the little horn as Antiochus Epiphanes. The value of Jerome's commentary lies largely in the fact that he preserved Porphyry's work, and to a lesser extent also rabbinic views. He adhered to the Antiochian tradition with its preference for historical rather than allegorical interpretation, but he defended the Christological interpretation of the stone in Daniel 2 and the one like a son of man in chapter 7. Throughout the patristic period, Daniel served as a source for chronological speculation rather than for imminent expectation. 
Augustine conceded the usual identification of the four kingdoms, but didn't dwell on it. The great majority of the church fathers argued that the 70 weeks of years had been fulfilled, either in the life and death of Christ or in the destruction of Jerusalem. The dual interpretation of Daniel 11, whereby the text referred to Antiochus Epiphanes, but also typologically to the Antichrist, remained popular down to the Middle Ages and is still found in Nicholas of Lyra in the early 14th century. Now, there is also a long and colorful history of the interpretation of the Four Kingdoms right through the Middle Ages. And eventually, it came to focus on the Turks as the Fourth Kingdom. Uh, <clears throat> a new element in the interpretation of Daniel appears in the late Middle Ages with the identification of the Pope as the Antichrist. And this, of course, uh, the anti-papal line of interpretation found its classic interpretation in Martin Luther. Luther published an exposition of Daniel 8 in his work on the Antichrist and a preface to the translation of Daniel in 1530, revised in 1541. Luther argued that the divine providence had arranged for the transfer of empire, learning and religion from Rome to Germany. Now, he wasn't the first to say that. Uh, this was something that had become fashionable in the Middle Ages. Uh, it, uh, it, so Luther says, it was with the Jews, but it went away. Rome and the Latin lands have also had it, but away it goes. And now they have the Pope. While Luther rejected radical millennialism, he affirmed that the end of days and the fulfillment of all prophecy was at hand. He understood Daniel to refer to the fall of Rome uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the Turks and granted that the little horn could refer to Muhammad as well as to the Pope. He saw a direct reference to the Pope as Antichrist in Daniel 11. Luther's exposition of Daniel 8 was translated into English. John Knox preached his initial sermon on Daniel 7 and predictably uh, identify the fourth beast as the Pope. Calvin tried to have a more historical interpretation. Uh, so uh, he granted that the fourth beast in Daniel 7 was Rome and the ten heads the Senate, but in Daniel 2 he insisted that the fourth kingdom was not Rome but the Seleucids and that the Christian era as a whole was identified with the stone cut from the mountain. Although he failed to appreciate the insights of Porphyry, Calvin at least attempted a historical interpretation, but on theological issues his positions were typically Protestant, dominated by the quarrel of the reformers with Rome. The trope of the translatio imperii, the transfer of the empire, was eventually applied to America. The Anglo-Irish philosopher George Berkeley wrote a poem entitled Verses on the Prospect of Planting Arts and Learning in America. The poem ended as follows. Westward the course of empire takes its way. The first four acts already passed. A fifth shall close the drama with the day. Time's noblest offering is the last. So he was actually following a long tradition there whereby people saw their own culture as the culmination of history. I will, it's the interpretation of the four kingdoms seems to have died out shortly after the Reformation. I think that the, uh, the the, the tradition of identifying each of these kingdoms with different powers, although you may still occasionally get it in evangelical Christian circles in the States. Since the rise of the historical criticism of the Bible, the great debates about universal history, the identification of the Antichrist, and millennial expectation are no longer taken seriously by scholars. Some scholars have lamented the decline in the importance of the book and in the culture at large. 
But the loss, I would submit, is really a gain. The prophecies of Daniel can no longer serve as Christological proofs or as guides to the structure of universal history. Attempts to calculate the end on the basis of the numbers in Daniel have always been problematic. The theological name-calling of the medieval and Reformation periods, especially with regard to the Antichrist, is no longer regarded as edifying. Viewed in its historical and literary context, Daniel is more akin to poetry than to historiography or futurology. While it is an important witness to the history of the Maccabean period, its witness is couched in the language of myth, richly informed by the mythological traditions of the ancient Near East. That language has often been misunderstood by literalist interpreters, but it has nonetheless enriched the religious imagination of the Western world. Thank you. days of Daniel up till now. Well, Any hands? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, this is a sort of like a maybe a little technical question, but I'm really interested in So yesterday we heard that in the book of Revelation, the name of Rome uh, is not mentioned and is replaced with some other different names. And if I understand correctly, today you said that in all these apocalyptic books you've mentioned, uh, there is a tendency to do the same, to replace Rome with something else, so not to say the exact word Rome. Uh, so can we talk about some kind of tendency with replacing the name of Rome among all the apocalyptic books in the Roman period, or in the later tradition too? So is there a tendency uh, in replacing the word Rome exactly, not writing exactly Rome and writing something else. And um, there, you know, already in Daniel, uh, the fourth kingdom mm -hmm. referred to something, mm -hmm. but it never names it. Mm -hmm. Now that leaves the door open for okay. somebody yeah. to come along a little bit later and say it's really somebody else. Mm -hmm. And you know that's really what I was talking about. Yeah. Is that how that process goes on? Okay. So then, in the Roman period, everybody says, "Of course, it's Rome. Mm -hmm. Who else could it be?" Then, with the rise of Islam, mm -hmm. some people say, "Oh no, no, it's Islam is the bigger empire." And so, so it goes. Uh, even you know, it's not so long ago. I think it was Ronald Reagan refer to the great Satan. <laughs> and, uh, you know, people tend to use biblical imagery to identify their opponents or to identify themselves in a positive way. So, yes, that, that tendency is there. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, it, it also uh, shows that, that you can't really say that a text like this has just one meaning. The meaning is going to change depending on the situation for the readers. Mm -hmm. of the uh, history of interpretation of one single uh, image, and I think it, can, can you say maybe that uh, it is quite typical for biblical uh, images and stories to be reinterpreted in so many ways according to uh, historical situations, so adaptations, so well, I think not only with apocalyptic images. Absolutely. I mean, it's especially true of apocalyptic images because people always wanted to refer to the wrong time. Uh, but it's true of, of other stories as well. That there's a very good book on the interpretation of the book of Jonah by Yvonne Sherwood, in which he points out that for centuries people thought the literal interpretive, the literal meaning of the book of Jonah was a prophecy of the resurrection. Now, from a modern historical critical point of view, it has nothing whatsoever to do with that. You know, it's the 
the fable uh, <laughs> that for much earlier time. But at the same time, for, for a period of history, it seemed just obvious that that's what the text meant. So, so I'm afraid we could all expect to be outdated, but we probably won't live long enough to see it. What we take as obvious meanings now would not seem obvious to people in a hundred years' time. Excuse me, what is your attitude to the Morris case? The idea that Porfiri borrowed his interpretation of foreign pies from the Syrian tradition, and this tradition was the original one. I think it is dead wrong. And, and in fact, I, almost everything that Morris Casey wrote, <laughs> in my opinion, with a strong head. The, you know, what you get, the Syriac tradition that, that Casey refers to isn't attested until about three or four hundred. It's first attested, I it's maybe Ephraim? Ephraim? Yeah. But it's not attested before that. And that is the first time anybody gives you a collective interpretation of the one like the Son of Man. Now, there were plenty of interpretations of it before that. In the spirituals of Enoch, it's a heavenly being. In the Gospels, it's an individual. In Fort Ezra, it's an individual. So it's you know, not until several hundred years after the Gospels that you get, uh, definitely several hundred years after Daniel, that you get anybody suggesting that it's a corporate thing. And, and the, what do you think about the original interpretation of these empires for being from Maccabees, for Hasmoneas? What was the original interpretation of The, the original empires? interpretation of Daniel, I think, was that the, that's an angelic figure, mm. and it's Michael. You know, I think later in the book of Daniel, it's Michael is the prince of Israel. At that time, Michael will arise, and it's after Daniel got the resurrection. So that's what no, this was not a pro Maccabean book. They were not looking to the Maccabees. But um, maybe Maccabees can interpret it in this um, son of man as their symbol. Uh, well, we have no reason to think that Maccabeus interpreted it at all. We don't know that the Judas Maccabee knew of the Book of Daniel. You know, this, as I say, wasn't written by one of his supporters. And it was probably written not long, uh, not long before Judas Maccabee died. Now, what the later Hasmoneans would have been, the later Hasmoneans tend to ignore it. You see, again, you can't assume that this was taken the scripture right away. If this was written, and I think it's quite demonstrable, that the, the book of Daniel was finished in late 164 BC, before the death of Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's already accepted as scripture, but that's a hundred years later. And I don't think the Hasmoneans would have accepted it at all. This was not part of their traditional scripture. fixed. 
you had to count them as four. And this continues in the tradition. Even when you change your mind as to who the four kingdoms are, you've still got to fit them as four. So later on, people combined the Medes and the Persians because they wanted to get Rome in. Now, for Daniel, I think, you see, this is relatively early in the history of that schema, but he changes the, the traditional schema would have been Assyria, Media, Persia. Now, Daniel changes it by putting in Babylon. Mm -hmm. But he, he still keeps media, well, there was no Median kingdom as far as the Jews were concerned, but he keeps it because it's got to be four. You know, in the, the same way everybody in the Christian and Jewish tradition has ten commandments, but people count them differently. You, but you can juggle them, you know, because if you divide one of them, then you've got to combine two others. But it's got to be ten. <laughs> so I think, and the, the significance of four is it's the, the, you know, the four cardinal points, in a way, so it gives you that sense of completion. It's not the only way of doing it. You could have seven, you could have ten. But probably not three or five. Very <laughs> yeah, they go on to that image of the statue from Daniel chapter two. Uh, just curious. I don't know whether, whether the, this idea has been proposed somewhere or not. But when we look uh, at the image that we have in Daniel 2, then the statue has had, and of course, every man uh, and every statue has one head, then a breast, a breast together with uh, hands are made of uh, that's a single piece. Yes. Something of silver, then of course uh, the belly and the thighs are also one piece, but when it comes to the legs and feet, the two pieces. Uh, and uh, when you follow the standard interpretation of this, as uh, the sequence of uh, ancient Near Eastern kingdoms ending with uh, the Hellenistic Age, and for the Hellenistic Age, of course, here in this region, we have not one kingdom, but two rival kingdoms, the yes. Cilicia Kingdom and the Ptolemaic Kingdom. Uh, can this, uh, the fact that uh, the last stage of history, according to Daniel, the Hellenistic stage, is mm, exemplified by two legs, namely two different pieces that do not contact each other, somehow relate to the fact that the mm, Near East, as it was under the uh, Persian Empire, so and so on, is now mm, fallen apart into two rival kingdoms. So that the number of lives can also have some symbolic meaning. Well, I think he definitely had that symbolic meaning for him. Though I don't know that he necessarily came up with the image of the statue for that purpose. But it certainly fitted his purpose very well. Because again, depending where you start the, the legs, so if you take it from the waist down, there's an initial unity <laughs> which then splits. And then you even say, and the toes also are, are little fragments. So that's part of his, his, um, his point is that, you know, also they're partly clay. The legs are weak. And so, I mean, it's a great image. They didn't include here. <clears throat> there's, um, there's a famous chart uh, that was uh, produced for a fundamentalist, dispensationalist construction of history, and has often been reproduced uh, with Daniel, it's the figure of it from Daniel chapter 2. And then identifying all sorts of figures in it down to the late 19th century. And I would suspect that you could probably find it updated somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, bringing it right up to date now. But it's had a great fascination for people. 
You know, it's an attempt to grasp history as a whole and to find a single unifying meaning in it. Yes. In the book of Daniel, we can find different pictures of the perspective as the kingdoms. Are any similarities between the book of Daniel and Enochian literature? I mean, first Enoch and his vision of the heavenly kingdom and the special role of the person who are on the clouds. So, uh, probably there is no one direction to interpret the book of Daniel with a comparison with the Maccabean literature. Are any perspectives to find some similarities with apocryphal, apocalyptical, Enochian literature and the perspectives of this fulfillment of the heavenly kingdom on the earth? Um, well, actually, that's, that relates to what I'll be talking about tomorrow, mm -hmm. actually, the question of millennialism. Yes. But I don't think, uh, in Daniel, Daniel is ambiguous itself. Because, on the one hand, the kingdom will be given to the people of the Holy Ones of Most High, the kingdom of all under heaven. And that gives you the impression that there will be a kingdom on earth. Mm -hmm. But then at the end of the book, it's all about the resurrection of the dead. Mm -hmm. In the Enoch literature, there's very little about earthly fulfillment. It's nearly all heavenly. Uh, so I think to get earthly fulfillment to any degree, you have to come down probably to 4th Ezra at the end of the first century. And 4th Ezra has it both ways. But first of all, you have a messianic reign that lasts for 400 years. You know, the Apocalypse of John would improve on that a little more time. Uh, but then at the end of the 400 years, the Messiah dies and the earth is returned to primeval silence. And, and then you have a new creation. So I think, you know, you had two traditions, mm -hmm. one of which was the earthly fulfillment and the other, the, uh, the heavenly fulfillment. And by the end of the first century, they were combining those so that you have the earthly fulfillment as a first stage. Mm -hmm. But I think I don't think before then. Now the Dead Sea Scrolls are also fairly ambiguous on that. Uh, that some passages seem to imply earthly fulfillment and others don't seem to be interested in it. But I'll take so that up actually tomorrow of the mm -hmm. lecture in Millennialism. Can you please just talk a bit more about uh, Zams and uh, are there any other shared motifs in Zams and Daniel? Or? I'm sorry, I didn't catch all of that. Could I speak a little more about what? Zams? Zams. Those. Uh, Persian, Persian, Midrashic commentaries on the Avesta. On the Avesta? Zans. Oh, okay, yes. The, the, the Zan, yes. Uh, well, you know, that's, it's in, it's part of the Persian tradition. This text that looks a bit like Daniel 2, that has Zoroaster so having a vision of a tree with four metals, that is part of what is called a zand. Now, a zand is a commentary, or like a midrash in the Jewish tradition. So what the, the zand typically does is quote, it doesn't do formal quotation and commentary the way we're used to in the, the modern world, but it, it kind of blends in translation and then elaboration of it. And now we don't really know when the oldest of these Zans began. Most the form in which we have them is fairly late 
but they could go well back into uh, the Hellenistic period. But you know, that's, uh, that's uh, a problem, and there is no agreement on it. Part of the problem, I think, is that people who work on Bible hardly ever learn the Persian language. And so you know, there's a whole, a whole career to be had there if you want to become the expert on, on the Persian. <laughs> it's very interesting. Thank you, John, for having drawn this picture and for having offered for some of our students some new ways of developing studies. Uh, what struck me when I was uh, hearing to your exposition of the vision of dinner and how it was interpreted later in Jewish and Christian uh, exegesis, what struck me is that uh, in Orthodox tradition, especially in the Russian Orthodox tradition, would not have uh, in interpretations of Daniel of that kind, though we have some uh, understanding of some, I would like to say, Orthodox dispensationalism, but of a very different kind. For example, as uh, already in the 16th century, when the 15th century, uh, a doctrine became popular in Russian Orthodox Circles that uh, there was once Roman Empire, first Rome, which uh, perished because uh, of its disbelief, lack of belief in Christ. Then there was the second Rome, the Byzantine Empire, which perished, which was destroyed by non believers, yeah. by Turks. Now we have third Rome. Namely, Moscow. Moscow, yes, Moscow, Russian Empire, and uh, there will be no fourth row at all. So, on the one hand, we have uh, the model quite close to that of Daniel, or to how Daniel uh, used to be interpreted, for example, in medieval, in Western medieval interpretation, or later in Protestant interpretation, but it's completely different imagery. And even numbers are different. There are three Romes, but the fourth kingdom will, be, will not exist. The world history ends with third Rome. I think it's very interesting. Yes. The question why? Why in this kind of uh, Russian Orthodox historical so, imagery? Because the figure three is sacred for us. Four is important for uh, Jewish people and three for our people. We don't want to have four. It's we should have four. Yes. yes. Pro probably, but on the, one, on the other hand, Daniel offers a ready imagery uh, for any kind of that historical worldview. And for some reason, this particular uh, stand in uh, uh, of Russian Orthodox theology didn't use the image of Daniel that was at hand. That's really, after, it's after really interesting. The, after the revolution, did the force become the rule of the proletariat? That was so for, for Marx and Hegel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.